In this tutorial, we're going to look at the conditions that need to be true for a beam such as the one shown on the left-hand side to be in static equilibrium. Now, we've seen both of these conditions before. The first one states that the sum of the forces must equal zero. And what we see in this instance is we've got two forces pushing downwards, F1 and F2, and we have the support reactions at the two ends of the beam, RA and RB. So for this first condition to be true, for the beam shown, what we're basically saying is that the forces pushing down, F1 plus F2, equal the forces pushing up, RA plus RB. So an alternative way of writing this condition in the top right hand corner is that the forces pushing down equal the forces pushing up. When we look at simply supported beams like this, we only ever have forces acting in the y direction, either downwards or upwards. Now our second condition states that the sum of the turning moments equals zero. And once again, we've seen this previously. But when we apply this to the beam, the sum of the moments equals zero about any point along that beam. So let's take an example in the center of the beam. And if we look at each of the forces, we can determine whether that force is going to be trying to turn this beam clockwise or anti-clockwise about that pivot in the centre. Now what we can see is that RA is trying to push the left side up, so it's trying to turn the beam clockwise. F1 is trying to push the left side down, so it's trying to turn it anti-clockwise. We've then got F2 trying to push the right side down, so trying to turn the beam clockwise. And we've got RB counteracting that and trying to turn the beam anti-clockwise. Now because that beam's in static equilibrium, it's not going to rotate. Therefore, the two moments trying to turn it clockwise, which is the turning moment caused by RA and the turning moment caused by F2, is going to be balanced by the other two turning moments trying to turn the beam anti-clockwise. Or said a different way, the clockwise moments minus the anti-clockwise moments equals zero. Now when we come to solve problems of this type, a typical question is going to ask you to find the two support reactions RA and RB, and the forces F1 and F2 will be given. Now the method that we use to solve these problems is first of all, we apply the condition that says the sum of the moments equals zero. And what we do is we take turning moments around either of our supports. So we can either take a turning moment about support A, or we can take turning moments about support B. So for this example, we'll use the support on the left about support A. Now there's an important reason why we do this. If we take turning moments about support A, then what you'll notice is that the force at A isn't going to cause a turning moment, because a turning moment is a force times a distance. We've seen this previously, written a different way. The sum of the forces times their perpendicular distances equals zero. And what we're saying here is that reaction at A is not offset at a distance from the pivot. So that eliminates the reaction at A from any of our calculations. We can then see that F1 is trying to turn the beam clockwise about the pivot. Force 2 is trying to turn the beam clockwise about the pivot. And the reaction at B is trying to turn the beam anti-clockwise. What we'll end up with is one equation with one unknown, and that unknown will be RB. So that is the first step in solving these problems. Then we move on to our second condition to find the other support. And the second condition says that the sum of the forces equals zero, or said a different way, the forces pushing down equal the forces pushing up. Well, when we get to this stage, we know F1 and we know F2. Condition 1 has enabled us to find RB, so the only unknown then is RA. We'll have an equation that states that F1 plus F2 equals RA plus RB, and the only unknown in that equation will be RA. There is just one more thing that's worth mentioning before we look at some specific examples. And this relates to the end conditions at point A and point B. All we've shown them here is arrows to represent the forces, but what we have is we have different end conditions. So I'm going to remove A, and in its place I'm going to put 
an end condition where that end of the beam is pinned. And by pinned we mean it's fixed in space, it can't move anywhere. That pinned support is still going to exert a force, RA, but what we're saying is that there's no movement at that joint. And I'm going to replace RB with a roller. So RB is going to have a roller as the support. Once again, that's still going to apply a vertical force, which we're calling RB. But the difference is that that joint will allow lateral movement or side to side movement. And if we consider what's going to happen to this beam under the forces F1 and F2, the beam is going to bend. Now if the supports at both A and B were pinned, then that would restrict that deflection. That would change the end conditions of the beam. Now when you get to later levels, such as level 4 and level 5, you will look at different end conditions, but all we're interested in in our calculations for this topic is the vertical forces RA and RB, or the vertical components of those forces. We're not interested in any horizontal components that may be set up as a result of the deflection of the beam.